You are welcome to this brief introduction to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 20 through 34, as we continue with our short series on Facing the End Times. Let's get into it. This well-known text begins with the declaration, Christ has been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. This text was originally composed for Greek readers by the Apostle Paul, writing to a church that he had helped establish in the city of Corinth in ancient Greece. The text is very well preserved. Only minor variations have appeared through copyist errors in the first five centuries. For example, manuscript Alexandrinus inserts the pronoun his before the noun enemies. Third century papyrus manuscript 46 and fourth century manuscript Vaticanus omit the term that after says, as do most English translations. In verse 31, manuscript Alexandrinus reads, my own boasting instead of my boasting in you, simply taking one Greek letter in place of the other, a common mistake when two words sound quite alike. And in verse 34, I say, lalo, in manuscript Alexandrinus, has a synonym, lego, I say. There are several important terms to understand in this text. For example, first fruits. This was a technical cultic or worship term in Greek religions, meaning first fruits, that is, the first portion of any kind, especially of animals, both domesticated and wild, which were thought to be holy to divinity and were consecrated before the rest could be put to secular use. It was also a term used for a birth certificate. In verse 24, we have the temporal adverb eta, meaning then, pertaining to being the next in order of time, and the term end, or telos, the last part of a process, its close conclusion, especially of the last things, the final act in the cosmic drama. We're told that Christ will put an end to rule, authority, and power. Scripture employs these terms for both human leaders and for fallen spiritual beings that deceive human leaders. These invisible beings, having rebelled against God, seek to destroy humanity in order to seize complete control over the earth. Thus, Jesus Christ must bring these beings into subjection before redeemed humanity can rule over all creation. We're told that Jesus must reign until the end, that is, to exercise authority at a royal level. To subject, of course, is to cause to be in a submissive relationship or subordinate. According to Luke chapter 10, Evil spirits must be subject to the disciples whom Jesus sends out, and of course they are to this day. Likewise, the prophetic spirits must be subject to the prophets in whom they dwell. We Christians, therefore, are urged to sober up, literally, of one recovering from a drunken revel. However, in Christian literature, it's used only figuratively, meaning to come to one's senses. Come to a sober and right mind. And the phrase, no knowledge, agnosia, means ignorance, not predominantly in the intellectual sense, but as in the speech of the mysteries, that is, the Greek mystery religions, a lack of religious experience or lack of spiritual discernment. This is why he says, some in Corinth have no knowledge of God. On the grammatical side of the text, we point out that Greek writers often employed the preposition en as a shortcut referring to complex relationships that their readers already understood. 
Thus, Paul writes in verse 22 about those who are in Adam and in Christ. And in verse 28, about God being in all things. Now, folk reading modern Bible translations, of the New Testament especially, often do not understand what the authors meant when they wrote about persons being in another person, such as being in Christ. So, you may have to explain first that to be in Adam means to be a natural descendant of the first human beings, that to be in Christ means to belong to him forever by faith, and that God, being in everything, means that he will one day take back rule over all that he has created. Part of the backstory of Paul's relations with the Corinthians relates to their existing beliefs. By the first century CE, most Gentiles had no record or tradition of human beings rising back from death, nor did their mythology describe gods dying and rising, contrary to common belief. Now, although Jews had a few stories of resuscitation and believed that their dead would rise in the future day of the Lord, they neither expected nor believed in resurrection in their own present day. Thus, some Christians had concluded that the dead do not rise. So Paul had to remind them of the good news about Jesus crucified, buried, risen, and appearing in the present as evidence of their own future resurrection. Just as a note, some mythical gods were said in pagan literature to be killed and later appear in the underworld, but they did not rise back to their former state. Thus, Jesus is no Christian version of a pagan god dying and rising, contrary again to popular internet beliefs. Now, the passage has a structure, not very complicated, it comes in chapter 15, which introduced a new subject with the conjunction de. The gospel I preached to you was that Christ was raised on the third day. An implication of this truth, again, is introduced by de, or and. If there is no resurrection of the dead, then your faith is in vain. Then followed again by de and an affirmation. In fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. As a logical explanation, in verse 22, we read, For, some text has fallen out, For Adam's descendants die, whereas Christ's followers rise. Followed by an affirmation, but each in turn, and an application otherwise, and of course you can read the text ending with an exhortation, sober up and stop sinning. There are a number of historical Christian doctrines that are present in this text, which you should underscore for new believers. In verse 20, of course, the resurrection of the historical Jesus from death to life. In verse 22, the reality of the historical Adam, explaining why we all die, and in verse 23, the future resurrection of the dead, especially of dead believers, which will come in the end times, ushering in the future kingdom of God, following the Jesus' defeat over powerful, wicked spirits. As you preach, teach, or lead Bible discussion groups, we recommend that you have participants read the text aloud and then to pose uh, queries or discussion topics, allowing everyone to reply and to discuss their understanding before you give your own interpretation. You might begin with asking, what does first fruits apply is coming? Well, of course, more of the same. What does it mean to be in Adam and to be in Christ?
these replies and, and the rest can be found in a document that you can download from a link in the description below. Does verse 22 say that all human beings will be saved by Jesus? Hmm. After reading verses 24 and 25, allow folk to work out the sequence of events mentioned in these two verses. And then as they do so, you can list them. After reading verses 26 through 28, discuss who is currently in charge of the whole world? And what is humanity's biggest problem, which Christ will solve forever? And who will be in charge of everything forever afterwards? Following verses 29 to 31, we recommend that you discuss, Are we supposed to get baptized on behalf of dead folk who were not baptized? Of course, you must reply, no, even though some Christians thought they should do so. Since we are to be raised back to life, how long should we try to stay alive now? Historically, many Christians have willingly run the risk of an early death in order to serve the Lord while they still could. We should do the same. And then after verses 32 and 34, Pose this query, or another one similar. What are some common human attitudes about life and death? Of course, the text cites to enjoy life, for this is all there is. Again, a common belief amongst Western atheists. And lastly, what does it matter whether we try to lead a moral life or not? Well, know this, that God judges sinful behavior. Your assignment for this week, then, is to read through 1 Corinthians 15, 20-34 once a day this week in different translations, if you have them. There are eight English translations available at the website netbible.org. As you do so, observe instructions on how Christians are to believe and to behave as the end times approach leading up to the culmination of history. Jot down other notes and queries that you want to discuss in your Bible study group. As a project, you might write an outline or draw a chart of main end-time events as revealed in 1 Corinthians 15. If you do so, make copies of your outline or chart and share these with members of your Bible study group. As you learn this text, as you endeavor to obey its instructions, and as you teach others helping them to do so alike, you will experience the rich blessing of the Holy Spirit of God in your life and ministry.